Well, on this weekend, we talk a lot about sacrifice, don't we? As well, we should. On this weekend, we remember the fallen who have sacrificed their lives for the freedom we enjoy and we cherish, and sometimes the freedom we don't even think about. We honor the men and the women who decided that life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness is much more than a catchphrase. But it's an ideal that's worth fighting for and, and forgiving everything for in order to ensure the preservation for future generations. Sacrifice is a word that um, we understand at least in theory, don't we? We may use it to describe a play in baseball. For example, for example, when a batter makes a sacrifice fly, hits the ball and it goes maybe deep into center field and the outfielder catches it, but the, third, the guy on third can tag up and go home and score a run. Now, the batter gets to go sit on the bench again, but as he goes to the bench, he gets the high fives because, hey, you, made it, you sacrificed yourself. Or maybe the bunt, that's also another one, base, playing baseball. Parents talk a lot about sacrifice, don't we? Especially when it comes to providing for their children and, and giving them the same or better opportunities that we had ourselves. We do that a lot. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into, I was just contemplating this this morning and I, as I was getting ready for church, I thought, how did Julie and I ever survive those years when we had like three or four little ones we all had to get ready for church? How, how did we ever make it to church on time? I don't even know. Because I was thinking how easy it was for me. I had to just worry about myself. I didn't have to worry about changing the diapers or doing anything that this morning. But there's a lot of sacrifice that goes in as a parent to, some, to a child who's two, or even when they're 21. There's sacrifices to be made there. Good and loving parents, they know what it means to sacrifice. Many people sacrifice tremendously when they go to work every morning. They, they get up at the crack of dawn, the alarm goes off, they, you wonder how they ever, how, they, how do they make it? You, sometimes you take the commute, you don't even know how you got there. But there you are. Maybe they're trying to get a business off the of ground. Maybe they're, maybe they're grading papers at 11.30 at night. Sometimes we have to work even longer hours or extra hours at work. And may, we may never even be uh, recognized for our effort. Or maybe they throw you a pizza party at the end of the, say, here, here's your slice of pizza. Glad you could work here for 30 years. That Daryl always jokes about that one. That's what he got after 40 years, his pizza party. But a lot of us, most of us are okay with that, aren't we? We recognize that what we did had value. And it's going to pay off in the future somehow. We, we, our sacrifice may not be recognized, but we have the satisfaction of knowing that there was a goal accomplished. There was a job well done. I sent a text to the, the, the folks who mowed the church lawn. Isn't that so, look, look so lovely today? They, they did the edging and they did the cutting. That was Tiffany and her, and her work, uh, her business. Cut the grass, that was so nice. Sometimes, though, let's face it, we don't have a very positive attitude about sacrifice. Sacrifice can be extremely inconvenient. It can be emotionally and physically draining. It can, it can be costly, and it, it can change the whole trajectory, trajectory of our life. More often than not, we're tempted to avoid sacrifice. Isn't that the truth? We don't want to sacrifice ourselves. We don't want to sacrifice our resources because sometimes it's just too painful. It's too costly, especially when we decide that we're not sure this sacrifice is even worth it. Is what we're sacrificing for, is it worth it? If we have questions about that, we, get, we begin to not like sacrifice. Over the past few years, one of my traditions during Memorial Day weekend, and this kind of a silly one, I always like to put in a DVD about one of the, one of the wars, uh, you know, a movie about the war. It might be Glory, it might be Gettysburg, it might be The Patriot. You know those movies that try to accurately portray what it must have been like, the harsh realities of war. Um, I never served in the armed forces, so I, I have no clue, concept of what that would be like. 
So that I guess this is my feeble attempt to try to maybe understand a, a little bit about the great sacrifices others have made. I'm not sure it's really working though because I usually walk away from those movies depressed and I wonder how is it that on one, on three days, on, on, on three days, 50,000 people in America died during the Civil War at, at Gettysburg. And I've, been, I've been to Gettysburg twice just to see, to, to look over the land and, and try to imagine it's just, and you might ask, I ask, could, was it worth it? Well, I'm here today to tell you something you probably never heard from the pulpit before, but I'm going to say, sacrifice less, not more. Now, that's a dangerous thing for a pastor to say, to sacrifice less. You might be saying to yourself, how could I sac if I sacrifice less, guess what, pastor, you're not going to get paid. The church will surely fail if I sacrifice left. It's on the backs of people that sacrifice that the church is even open. Any, any sacrifice, that's the good things of life come from sacrifice. So how could the pastor stand up here and say, do less, not more of that? Well, let me clarify and say this. Sacrifice less, but love God more. Does that, maybe that sounds a little better. I wouldn't say this if I didn't have the Bible to back me up on this, okay? Because it's typically dangerous to encourage your congregation to sacrifice less. But look what God says in Psalm 40. He says, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire. Speaking, this psalmist is speaking about God. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not require. And Psalm 51, 16, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not Take pleasure in burnt offerings. How about 1 Samuel 15, 22, when Samuel rebukes King Saul for disobeying God's orders. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as the obeying of the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the, the fat of the rams. I think the picture can be start to become clear for us now. It's not that God does not like sacrifice. He does, but he wants us to sacrifice out of the proper mo motivation. That's the important thing here. He wants us to sacrifice out of love for, for him. Not out of a guilty conscience, not out of the practi practicality sake, not out of making sure this, if I sacrifice this, you know, I'm going to get a, a a rebate on my taxes, or deduction of my taxes. Don't do it out of a guilty conscience. Don't do it out of religious duty or obligation. Sacrifice out of love. As a matter of fact, when our motivation is different when we sacrifice, and it isn't out of love, we typically end up regretting our decision and actually resenting the person or the, or the thing that we, tr we tried to sacrifice for. For example, sacrificing for the sake of a guilty conscience does nothing to make us righteous before God. Our guilt before God is only taken away when we go to God and confess our sins and believe that Christ's work on the cross. That is what can save us. The Apostle Paul, Apostle John writes in the first letter, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins, and he will, he will purify us from all unrighteousness. Do you know in that, that verse there, there's nothing said about sacrifice. But how many times have you heard people who say, well, I just want to do something for the church or for God, because deep down, it helps them ease their guilty conscience. They think that somehow that's gonna, gonna help them. Maybe a couple who, has, who hasn't gone to church in many years, but they want to get married in the church, and so it will somehow justify all the years they live together. They say, well, we'll just get married in church, you know. We'll sacrifice that instead of going to the, the justice of the peace or the court. Maybe someone wants to give a large sum of money to the church to, quote-unquote, balance the scales for all the years they've been running away from God. This will make it all better. That's what they think. 
Maybe the absentee parent volunteers his or her time at an after-school program at the church because they feel guilty by all, of, all those years that they ignored their own child. As a pastor, these sorts of comments raise red flags to me. If I'm unable to get to the root of, of a person's um, motivation for sacrifice, I cannot in good conscience um, honor their request because I may be giving them a sense of false security in their own eternal salvation. It is only by God's grace does a man enter into a right relationship with him. If I somehow as a pastor mislead them in this vital truth, I could be doing irreparable damage to them, to them spiritually, to their soul. I don't want that on my hands. I need to tell everybody that I come in contact with and I talk to about this. The Lord's, the righteousness that we can share, God's righteousness comes in faith in his son Jesus. So let's go back to Saul's story for a moment. Why did the Lord pass such a harsh judgment on Saul, King Saul? Remember, King Saul, he... he he won this great battle, and then, and then in his disobedience, he, he, he decides that, well, I'm going to hold a few of these, the animal back, and I'm going to spare King Agag's life. And isn't that a, that's kind of a crazy name. And, uh, but anyway, he spares a few of these animals when the Lord said, destroy them all. Get rid of them all. But you see, what happened is Saul believed he knew better than God. Saul, in the name of practicality, went against God's command, although God told him to spare nothing. And Saul thought, well, I know better. I, this, you know, he, God's going to overlook this. Instead, it says, he obeyed the voice of the people. He did not obey the voice of God. He actually said, I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. So he had an excuse. Saul, the chosen one to be the king, the king of God's nation. But if, the, but if God's leader of the nation will not heed the word of God, why should the people be expected to do the same? So Samuel pronounces, God's prophet Samuel announces God's judgment on against Saul. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. On the outside, Saul's offense against God seems minor. But on the inside, it comes down to Saul's unwillingness to heed God's word. This should be a stark reminder to all of us, shouldn't it? God's word is not to be trifled with, even in simply, even in the little things in life. Because guess what? Life happens in the little things. Sometimes if we wait around just for the big things of life, well, then we miss, we miss life, don't we? We miss all the little things in life. It's the little things that make the difference in all the world because it's the little things that typically go unnoticed by man, but they're never overlooked by God. Listen to these verses that relate to this theme. It says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. 2 Chronicles 16. Does he not see my ways and count my every step? Job 31. My eyes are on all their ways. This is God speaking in Jeremiah. They are not hidden from me, nor is sin concealed from my eyes. Let's face it, many of us, we like to make a big splash for God as Christians. But few of us see the value of doing the little things for God. And the reason is because the big things tend to get noticed by, by other people. But the little things don't. If our neighbor notices our good deeds, then 
we can count on a bigger pat on the shoulder and more recognition in the community and in the pews. But if he doesn't notice, then we're wondering, is the sacrifice we just did, was it worth it? But God assures us that the little things do matter. Probably even more so than the big things because maybe our motivation to do the little things is, is more pure. This is not to say that doing big things for God is wrong. We can do big things for God. It's just that our reason for doing it can be easily confused between service to God and recognition from men. Sometimes we, we get those things confused. Remember the story of the, of the widow's might in Luke 21 as Jesus was in the temple and he sees the rich putting the gifts into the temple treasury. He saw the poor widow put in very two s- small copper coins. And, I, and he says, I tell you the truth, sh- this widow, this poor widow has put more in than all the others. All of these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, she put everything she had in. Maybe this act by the widow demonstrates a deeper love for God because in parting with those two copper coins, what did she have to do? She had to, she had to trust her life to God. And it's impossible to trust God until we, fi- until we get to know him and to love him. Well, I want to give you one other reason why we should sacrifice less and love more. And that's because Jesus sacrificed all. We can sacrifice less because guess what? Jesus sacrificed all. These days it seems like every other movie trailer that comes out is about some superhero, right? I can't keep up with all the different revisions of the di- Spider-Man or Batman or Superman or the Avengers. And I, would, and I went to a movie a few years ago and walked away wondering what just happened. I didn't, quite, didn't even understand it. But what is interesting is that the world seems to be obsessed and fascinated with, with people who have extraordinary powers. It's because I guess we all want one, don't we? We all want a superpower. And you might have seen the, the, the little bumper stickers now. It says, this is my superpower, okay? You know, I don't know, drinking coffee is my superpower. I don't know. I mean, everybody comes up with... They all need a superpower now. And I don't know what yours is. But for for one of the, and I think partly everybody wants a superpower because they see all the injustice and the wrong that's going on in the world. And they wish they could snap their fingers and make it better and make it right. They see the unscrupulous, corrupt businesses or government. And they say, somehow I had a superpower, I could make a change, and I could somehow restore the balance that we the imbalance we see in society. And we, because every day we say, that's not right. We see something in the news, or we say, that's not right. I wish I could make it different. <clears throat> but I'm not sure having a superpower, each of us individually having a superpower, I don't, I'm not sure that's going to help. We need to look to the one who is the original superpower and has a superhero. When we see Christ's sacrifice in its proper perspective, we can put aside our superhero dreams. We no longer have to play savior of the world. We have a savior of the world. We no longer have to play the savior of the company, the savior of this relationship or that relationship, or the savior of the church, or the savior of the family. God has done it for us. And if we attempt to put ourselves in his place, we're making a very huge mistake. Christ Jesus is the original superhero. He has all the power and the authority in heaven that was given to him by his Father. And for us to even attempt to usurp it from him, 
his legitimate reign over our lives, if we are trying to, to circumvent that, then we are opposing God. And it's not going to work well for us. No, Christ is our superhero, and if we deny this truth, then the Bible says we can have no, we can have no part of him. Jesus has done the sacrificing. Jesus has done the supernatural, that which no human being can ever accomplish. So now it's up to us to love him more, to thank him more, to worship him more. And if this means sacrificing, fine, we should do that. But let's do it first and foremost out of our love for him. The book of Hebrews speaks so much about that Jesus being the original superhero. The author tells us he was far superior above the angels. That's why, that's why he says, let all of God's angels worship him. That the Son of Man, he is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation of God's being. And that he provided purification for our sins, forgiveness for our sins. And then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Imagine that. Jesus' sacrifice brings us forgiveness, brings us cleansing of our souls. No one on earth could have ever accomplished such an amazing and important task. The author of Hebrews continues telling us Jesus is greater, not only is he greater than angels, he's greater than, the, 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 than Moses, the, one, the, the person that the Jews look up to as the patriarch of their religion, which also includes Abraham. But Moses was a faithful as a servant in God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But it says Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. So Moses was the, the tenant or the resident in the house. Jesus was over the house. He's greater than Moses. And finally, it's also brought up, and that's the book of Hebrews, speaks about Jesus being greater than any of the priests. Simply because the priests, they would have to repeat the sacrifice they were done repeatedly, day in and day out, for as long as they held off us, and yet their sacrifices can never take away the sins of the people. Only Christ's sacrifice of himself, who is holy and blameless, could put away the sins, cover the sins, give us an opportunity to have a right relationship with our Creator. Listen to the author of Hebrews as he describes his description of Jesus. And this is what Blake read earlier. When Christ came as high priest, what did he do? He entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained our eternal redemption. He bought it. He purchased it. He claimed it. He gives it to us. He shares it. Our eternal redemption. Christ who offered himself unblemished, I mean without sin, he cleanses our conscience so that we may serve the living God. So when we serve God, we serve him out of love. So my call to you on this Memorial Day is surprising because I say sacrifice less. Not because the church doesn't need your help, but because your sacrifices, when done out of an impure motive, they, that leads to death. But true sacrifice offered with the proper motivation of love, it always has, brings the fruit of life. The author of Hebrew concludes, Jesus lives forever, and he has a permanent priesthood. His superheroism never ends. Therefore, he is able to save completely that's you and me, who come to him, come to God through him. Because right now, the superhero's at work, interceding for us on our behalf before the Father. Jesus Christ, the one, the only, the original superhero. Remember that this Memorial Weekend.